welcome to another lecture in our lecture series on design of multi story rcc office building based on nepal national building code 105 2020 in our previous lecture we completed the modeling of our structure and today we will start with analysis and design of our structure in etaps but before starting with analysis and design i want to review a few topics that i discussed in our previous lecture and some one or two steps that are still left to complete the modeling part first we haven't applied any restraint to our structure at the bottom so we will first apply a restraint and for that go to plan view at the base select all your joints and then assign joint restraint select this fixed joint and then click on okay now the fixed joint has been applied to the base of our structure and after applying restraint uh, we made an error while calculating and applying swell pressure load on our basement wall in our previous lecture so we will review that topic a little bit here let's just select one basement wall here and then go to assign cell sorry assign cell load and go to uniform here not uniform this will be non uniform so go to assign cell load non uniform if you see here we have a formula for non uniform load load at point x y z is ax plus by plus cz plus d and we have to put the values of these coefficients a b c d by ourselves and the value of these coefficients should be inserted here and its unit is given at the side here so how do we calculate the value of these coefficients for swell pressure okay this is what we did last time let me just correct this here so the value of our load at point p whose coordinate is x y z is ax plus by plus cz plus d so if we suppose that this is our basement wall then the swell pressure will act in this way so for this plane here that we are talking about along this basement wall the variable that varies is z x and y do not vary along the height of this basement wall so x and y will be zero means these two terms will be equal to zero and the thing that remain is p is equal to cz plus d now we have to calculate the value of cz c and d here and we know that the load or the swell pressure load that is acting at the bottom is given by the formula ka gamma and h instead of h we can write here z also so this k we left this k in our previous lecture when we discussed the swell pressure load so k is the coefficient of active swell pressure gamma is the unit weight of swell and z is the height along this basement wall so z is equal to here the height of our story is 3.6 meter so at this bottom point z is equal to 3.6 so insert the value of 3.6 here and the pressure value will be calculated and then we will uh, we will find one equation and since we have two unknown coefficients here we need another equation and to find another equation the value of z at the top at this top the value of swell pressure will be zero so our second equation will be p will be equal to zero and z will be the value 
which is equal to 0. The value of z at the bottom is 3.6 and the value of z at top is 0. So putting these values here, then you will get the coefficients c and d. So first, let's calculate the pressure at point here. Here our pressure will be, we, if we suppose that the value of active earth pressure is 0 0.33. This value of active earth pressure you can derive from soil test report after finding the angle of internal friction. The unit weight of soil is 18 kN per meter cube and the height here is 3.6. So you get the value of pressure to be equal to 21.384. Here you will get 21.384. Insert this value of 21.384 here. 21. Let's say 4. So see the value of Z at this bottom where we have calculated this 21.4 pressure will be zero. So, sorry, the value will be the value of z will be zero here. So, c into zero plus d. Now, using this equation, you get the value of d to be 21.4. And then to find the value of c, the pressure at the top will be zero. So, pressure equals to zero. The value of z will be 3.6, so 3 into c into 3.6 plus the value of d will be 21.4. So you get the value of c from this formula that is 21.4 divided by 3.6, you get minus 5.94. So the value of c will be minus. 5.94 in this way you can calculate the value of c and d here and then we use this coefficient in our formula in etabs so for that go to select select properties wall section we will select the basement walls here and also one wall here and then we will go to assign cell load non-uniform the application of this load will be in the local three axis we discussed about local three axis in our previous lecture the load pattern is swell pressure so and the value of c and d will be the value of c will be minus 5.94 and the value of d will be 21.4 21.4 and then click on OK. So in this way you can apply the soil pressure severe model. And one final thing before completing this modeling part is I want to discuss the use of rigid and semi-rigid diaphragms. And for that Let's go to one slide that I have prepared here. Okay, this codal provisions, I listed these codal provisions from the ASCE 710 code, which is the code for minimum design loads for building and other structures. And in this ASCE 7 code, in 12.3, talks about the diaphragm flexibility, configuration, irregularities, and redundancy. And what this 12.3.1 says is that regarding diaphragm flexibility, the structural analysis shall consider the relative stiffnesses of diaphragms and the vertical elements of the seismic force resisting system. Okay, and this, this is the important line here. Unless a diaphragm can be idealized as either flexible or rigid in accordance with sections, these sections 12.3.1.1, 1.2, and 
the structural analysis shall explicitly include consideration of the stiffness of the diaphragm that is semi rigid modeling assumption so in these 12.3.1.1 there are some conditions for assigning flexible flexible diaphragm in 3.1.2 a rigid diaphragm condition and in 3.1.3 the calculated flexible diaphragm condition if the conditions listed in these three clauses are met then we can either assign flexible diaphragm or rigid diaphragm accordingly but if these conditions are not met then we have to assume semi rigid diaphragm that is we are assuming or we are considering the stiffness of the diaphragm so let's see the conditions for flexible diaphragm first diaphragms constructed of untopped steel decking or wood structural panels are permitted to be idealized as flexible if any of the following conditions are met where the vertical elements are steel braced frames steel and concrete composite braced frames or concrete masonry steel or steel and concrete composite shear walls in one and two family dwellings and in structure of light frame construction so ours is a rcc structure so we don't have these diaphragms consisting of steel decking or wood panels so we can ignore or we can say that our diaphragm is not flexible and in another clause diaphragms of concrete slabs or concrete filled metal deck with span to depth ratios of 3 or less in structures that have no horizontal irregularities are permitted to be idealized as rigid so diaphragms of concrete slabs or concrete filled with metal deck they can be idealized as rigid and then another we have the calculated flexible diaphragm condition so we can assign our diaphragm rigid in other rcc structures which are regular and have no horizontal irregularities here is the line that have no horizontal irregularities but since we have re entrant corner irregularity that means our building is not perfectly square or rectangle we have the re entrant corners this is the plan of our building these are the re entrant corners re entrant corner is a type of horizontal irregularity and since the horizontal irregularity is present in our building we cannot assign rigid diaphragms also so what we have to do is we have to change the diaphragm from a rigid to semi rigid in our model the same code in clause 12.7 also talks about structural modeling and in structural modeling what it says is that structures that have horizontal structural irregularity type 1a 1b 4 or 5 of table 12.31 this one is torsional irregularity extreme torsional irregularity out of plane offset irregularity and non parallel systems shall be analyzed using a 3d representation and let's see another line here where the diaphragms have not been classified as rigid or flexible in accordance with section 12.3.1 the section that we talked about before the model shall include a representation of the diaphragm's stiffness characteristics that means the diaphragm should be semi rigid and such additional dynamic degrees of freedom are required to account for the participation of the diaphragm in the structure's dynamic response so all of these clauses are saying what they are saying is that we have to consider semi rigid diaphragm so what we shall do is we will go to define and diaphragms and what i did was in our previous lecture i defined a separate diaphragm for all the floor systems i think we did that but i have changed it and i have just defined one diaphragm here left click and modify so diaphragm and instead of rigid click on semi rigid and click on okay click on okay and after doing that select all the slabs that we have here go to select select properties slab section and select slab 125 close and then go to assign cell diaphragms select d1 and then click on okay so we have assigned the diaphragms also and then save the model so our modeling part is complete we discussed about some corrections that we have made to our model from the previous lecture now we will start analysis 
and before starting analysis go to analyze and check model select or deselect all we want to check if our model is correct if there are any errors or not click on ok so the software is checking the model and model has been checked no warning messages were generated so it's okay our modeling is correct and finally now we can perform the analysis go to analyze run analysis it will take some time let's wait with patience Okay, let me just remove these contours here so our model has been analyzed and the figure that is being displayed currently is the deflection of our structure for dead loads you can see a displacements dead load you can go to display and display deformed shape and check the displacement of your structure for different load cases and load combinations or for model cases so this is the deflection for dead load if you select here live load then click on apply this is the deflection under live load so you can see that the deflection of our structure is towards gravity so we can say that our deflection is correct and then you can again check for the eqx in ultimate state this is the you can see that our structure is deflecting in the x direction similarly eq x for serviceability step again it is deflecting there is comparatively lesser deflection in serviceability step and then you can check for eq y also now the structure is deflecting in y direction so you can see that our load have been applied correctly because under x direction earthquake it is deflecting in x direction under y direction earthquake the structure is deflecting in y direction under the dead and live load the structure is deflecting vertically that means towards the gravity so it is okay and let's just close this for now now there are some post analysis checks that you have to perform in our building and the first thing that we want to say since this is our irregular building let's review the fundamental mode shapes again if you want to learn in detail about what are these mode shapes and what do they represent please go to our youtube channel and check out our first playlist on design of rcc residential building based on is 8093 code in that playlist i have talked in detail about the concept of mode shapes we want to review the fundamental mode shapes of our structure so let's go to display and show tables either you can press ctrl t or you can go to display and show tables and then this is already selected because i have checked it before also go to analysis results and under analysis results go to structure output and go to modal information and click on this modal participating mass ratios and then click on ok So you can see that currently there are 12 modes and this column shows us the time period of our structure the fundamental time period is 1.953 i think this is a little higher for our case we will see about that and the first mode is translation in y direction you can see that because about 33 percentage of mass is participating in translation in y direction which is very less and if you go to rz here you see almost 29 percentage of mass is participating in rotation in the first mode itself so this is not a desirable condition mode shapes means uh, these fundamental mode shapes are those things or these are those deflections in our structure for which the structure finds its easiest. 
this mode 1 means the structure finds it easiest in mode 1 or finds it uh, easiest to rotate and rotation or torsion in our building is not a desired phenomenon so almost 30 percent of mass is participating in rotation along z axis so which is not a desirable condition and you have to change some properties in our structure or in our building to correct for these mode shapes again you can go to mode 2 you see that almost 59 percentage of mass is participating in translation in the x direction this is a good one and in mode 3 you can see that 41 percentage sorry 64 percentage of mass is participating in rotation so mode 1 and mode 3 are primarily rotation and mode 2 is a translation so having rotation in our first mode is not a desirable phenomenon so we have to correct for these mode shapes and to correct for these mode shapes there are some techniques one thing that you can do is if you had rectangular columns in your structure then you could change the orientation of those columns for example if we had rectangular columns like these in our structure and if the mode shapes were not desirable then you could change these orientations you could change the direction in which the longer side of the column will be acting so that if the deflection is more in that direction then there will be higher stiffness after changing the orientation and then you can correct for the undesired displacements but since we have square columns in our building and also our building is very irregular there is horizontal irregularity in our building then the change in orientation of our column is not an option for us we either have to introduce new shear walls or change the locations of shear walls you can see that we have shear walls constructed in our building for this uh, lift core or lift shaft and the presence of this shear wall is also affecting the mode shapes of our building so either we have to add new shear walls at new places or you have to remove this shear wall for lift altogether and you have to build masonry structure for the lift core also so let's first or we will learn how to introduce shear walls at what places to correct for these mode shapes for now remember we have very low participation in translation and first mode only 33 and about 29 percentage is participating in rotation so to introduce shear walls what we can do is go to plan view at the top floor seventh floor and so if you see here let's see the deflected shape of this top floor first under earthquake in x direction you can see there is large deflections here and for earthquake in y direction you can see there is comparatively more rotation for earthquake in x direction for earthquake in y direction than for earthquake in x direction you can see at this point there are large deflections or rotation occurring so if you introduce a shear wall like this from top to bottom in this figure if you introduce some shear wall here then maybe we can control for this excessive rotation or excessive displacement that is occurring at this end so let us introduce a shear wall at this side here for that unlock the model let's see we are introducing a shear wall at this side this is elevation d so go to elevation d and we are introducing a shear wall here remember your architectural configuration should also allow for the introduction of shear walls. Many times architects who have prepared the drawings do not allow for the introduction of shear walls at all places. So you have to check for that also. For now, since we are not concerned with that, let us just introduce shear wall here. I don't want to introduce shear wall along this whole frame. I only want to introduce for the middle portion because that may also be sufficient. So for that, first I will select these two beams and then edit edit frames and divide frames i want to select the mid portion so i will divide it into three frame objects and then click on ok 
and then go to this draw rectangular floor wall option select for shear wall and then draw the shear wall here in the middle portion now i want to replicate it these to the top floor so select this wall control r replicate i want to replicate it from second to seventh story click on ok so our shear walls have been drawn here go to 3d view our shear walls have been introduced here now then run the model again and check for your mode shapes again so it will take some time have patience So the analysis is complete click on ctrl t let's see the more shapes again now we can say let's look here 63 percentage of mass is participating in x direction translation and the rotation is still 39 percentage sorry this is r y we have to look r z okay the rotation has decreased to some 0.65 percentage and again 62 percentage of mass is participating in y direction for the second mode and for the third mode if you see 62 percentage mass is participating in the rotation so our mode shapes have been corrected let's see here our period of vibration has also decreased now x and y are fundamentally translational modes and only the third mode is the rotational mode so this is corrected you may have to introduce shear walls at other places also it may not be corrected from the first time itself and another thing that we have to check after correcting for these fundamental modes is that we have a codal provision in both is code and nepali code also in this nepalese code clause 7.3 a sufficient number of modes shall be included in the analysis to include at least 90 percent of the total seismic mass in the direction under consideration so let's go to our e-tabs and see that we have 12 modes considered here and the sum is 84 percent the cumulative mass participation is 84 percent only in the x direction and 83 percent only in the y direction so this should be minimum 90 so we have to increase the number of modes here to do that let's unlock the model first go to define model cases and then modifier showcase and then for the maximum number of modes here let's say we will select 20 here and then click on ok ok and then run the model again so if we increase the number of modes the analysis time will also be increased now click on ctrl t again and then let's check the mode shapes once again and let's see that still 20 number of modes is not sufficient since we only have 86 percent is mass participation so let's unlock the model again go to define and model cases modifier showcase let's increase the number of modes to be considered to 35 click on ok ok and read on the model or read on the analysis so let's check the mass participation once again this should be enough now click on ok but still there are it's not reaching 90 it's only 87 percentage so what i will do is i will unlock this model and go to define model cases once again and i will increase the number of modes to 70 for now and then read on the analysis So let's check the mass participation once again.
okay now it is 96 percentage a uh, 90 percentage mass participation is being reached for x direction in this 40th mode and for the y direction in this 45th mode so it's okay let's click on done now another thing that you want to check i did not discuss it but there is one thing that you may check based on the indian code what indian code says is that in this table 6 we have the definition of irregular building in our indian code and in indian code what it says is that in buildings located in seismic zones 4 and 5 it shall be ensured that the first three modes together contribute at least 65 percent mass participation factor in each principal plan direction that means the sum ux and sum ui should be at least 65 percent in the third mode and you may check that also but i think already we have 66 percent of mass participation in the first and second mode itself in x and y direction so this condition is readily fulfilled now after you have checked and reviewed for fundamental mode shapes you have to check for interstory deflection or you have to check for drift and what the nepali code says is that the ratio of the interstory deflection to the corresponding story height that means the value of our drift should not exceed 0.025 at ultimate limit state and 0.006 at serviceability limit state so remember these values for ultimate limit state 0.025 and for serviceability limit state 0.006 so how do we calculate this interstory deflection here what it says in 5.6.1 is that for the ultimate limit state the design horizontal deflections shall be determined by multiplying the horizontal deflection found from equivalent static method or the response spectrum method by ductility factor our ductility factor for ultimate limit state was 4 so for checking the drift in ultimate limit state we have to multiply this interstory deflection by the ductility factor whereas for serviceability limit state the design horizontal deflection that we obtain from the ETAPS itself will be taken as the horizontal deflection for calculating the drift. So remember this for ultimate limit state it is 0.025 and for serviceability limit state it is 0.006. So let's go to our ETAPS model and go to display and story response plot. And in this story response plot you can see the response of a structure for different calculations or different factors since we are checking story drift here i will select the display type as maximum story drift and first we will check for the eqx ultimate limit state and i will select the output type as maximum and for i will be displaying this drift from not for all stories I will discuss about this later on i want to display it from not from base but from print level so this is the value of our drift for the ultimate limit state earthquake in x direction and you can see that the maximum displacement in our or maximum drift in our case if you see at the bottom it is 0 0.013326 0. 013326 you have to multiply this by the value of 4 which is our ductility factor so you get the deflection to be 0.013326 into 4 means 0.0533 and this 0.0533 this value is greater than 0.025 so the drift provision is not being fulfilled or the condition of drift is being exceeded by our building so there is undesirable amount of drift in our building similarly if you check for the ultimate state drift for y direction eqy uls you will find that it is 0 
and if you multiply this by the ductility factor 4 you get to be 0 0.031 so again the drift in y direction is also exceeded and let's check for serviceability limit state eqx sls 0 0.012 which is very much larger than 0 0.006 and for EQY SLS, it is 0 0.0076, which is larger than 0 0.006. So our drift condition is not being satisfied for both earthquake in X and Y direction for all for both ultimate and serviceability limit state. So let's close this response spectrum response plot here first. So if you go to plan view and the seventh floor and then choose the deflected shape for EQX ULS you can see here there are large deflections so one thing that we can do for the correction of this drift is the introduction of shear walls so there is since there is very large deflection in the x-axis if you introduce a shear wall along this x-axis that means parallel to the x-axis here increasing the stiffness in the x direction then you can most probably control the drift so for that what i will do is i will introduce new shear walls since i don't want shear walls to be in one direction making the structure more unsymmetric i will introduce shear wall first here in this elevation one and then here in this elevation five so let's go to elevation elevation one I will introduce a shear wall here in the middle again remember your architectural condition may not allow for the introduction of shear wall so i will do same process that i did before i will first divide these frames into three parts then i will just draw shear wall here i will select this shear wall and then replicate it to the top force top force from second to seventh and then click on OK. OK, in seventh, you don't have a floor here, so I will just delete this. And now I will join these frames once again. Go to Edit, Edit Frames, and Join Frames. I will join the frames in this direction also. I forgot to do that previously. These one, two, three. One, two, three edit edit frames and join frames then i will introduce another shear wall here on top of this entrance to the basement so this is our elevation 4 elevation 4 let's see again if i have yes go to elevation 4 let's divide these frames and then introduce shear wall here select option select this shear wall replicate either you can go to edit and replicate or you can click on ctrl r go to story from seven second to seven story and then click on ok and select these divided frames once again and go to edit edit frames and join frames so i have introduced shear walls on two sides of the building remember introducing shear walls at many places like this is not a desirable option since it will increase the cost of our building the main or the primary solution or the best solution will always be if possible if the site condition allows to change the architectural plan of the building itself so now I will rerun the analysis here. So after the analysis is complete, let's first check for our more saves because since we have introduced shear walls at new places, our more saves may have changed significantly. Go to display show tables and the same option is already selected here and then click on OK. First, let's see that the time period has reduced significantly. Introduction of shear walls has reduced time period from about, 
I think it was about 1.6, 1.7 previously. Now it has decreased to 1.281. And let's see here. Now the more steps have changed here. The first mode is a torsional mode once again. You can see here. There is. It's not a torsional mode, but rather it is a coupled mode here. You can see 36 percentage of mass is participating in x direction and 27 percentage in y direction similarly in second mode also it seems a coupled mode 28 percentage and 35 percentage and mode 3 is a rotational mode 62 percentage so what happened is that the mode sets have changed because of the introduction of the shear ones so you have to correct for that also so this is a rigorous process and will need your experience, judgment and many a times luck also. Sometimes what may happen is in the very first step you will get everything correct and other times you may have to perform trial and error more than one time. So let's go to the show deflected shape option here and let's check our deflected shape for mode number one. And then start our animation here. Let's see the deflection. similar is the case for mode 2 and for mode 3 you can see the rotation you can see it so what we can do is either we can change the whole orientation or structural plan of our building or you may have to introduce shear wall at other places also so let me just introduce shear wall at one another place Although it is not an economical option anymore to introduce shear walls, the best thing would be most probably to remove this shear wall for lift core also and then construct masonry walls for lift and then check for other things. But I want to try this one last option here. I want to introduce this shear walls at elevation 5. So I will unlock the model, go to elevation 5. Select these beams, edit, edit frames, divide frames into three. Let's draw shear wall. Select this, control R for replicate from story two to seven. Click on OK. Now select these beams once again and go to edit, edit frames and divide frames. Sorry, not divide frames, edit edit frames and join frames so our frame have been joined once again now let's run the model again now let's check our mode shapes control t for displaying table click on ok okay now it's again corrected here let's see 60 percentage is participating in first mode and 60 percent is in second mode and in the third mode is a rotational mode it has 62 percent is rotation so introduction of shear wall at another place has corrected the mode shapes now after correcting for mode shapes let's check the drift once again go to display so response plot and display type maximum story drift we will first select for eqx maximum and from we will see from first floor to seventh floor and okay not first floor plinth level to seventh floor now you see here the maximum drift is displayed is 0 0.006991 0 0.006991 multiply this by the ductility factor 4 and we get 0 0.0279 
so 0.0279 is only a little bit more than 0.0025 which is our codal provision so you have to get this value below 0.0025 but for the purpose of this lecture video i will consider it to be okay only for the purpose of this lecture video similarly for eq y in ultimate limit state it is 0.007391 if you multiply this by 4 you get 0.029 so this is also a little bit more than 0.0025 the only purpose of this video is to teach you how to check these things we are not actually constructing this building so i will leave this as it is and for serviceability limit state 0.006735 it's a little bit more than 0.006 and for eqy in serviceability limit state 0.007 so let's say now this drift value are okay let's close this so we have checked for the mode shifts and we have checked for the interstory deflection and drift ratios. Okay, let me see. Okay, there are two irregularities. One irregularity that is present in our building. This I talked about it a little ago. The re-entrant corner irregularity. So these are the re-entrant corners here. A structure is said to have a re-entrant corner in a direction if its structural configuration has a projection of greater than 15% of its overall dimension in that direction. That means if this value of yxp is greater than 15% of x or the value of this yp is greater than 15% of y, then it is re-entrant corner irregularity and we say that this irregularity is present in our building. Similarly, torsion irregularity. Torsion irregularity is considered to exist where the maximum horizontal displacement of any floor in the direction of the lateral force at one end of the story is more than 1.5 times its minimum horizontal displacement at the far end of the same story. So if this delta max is greater than 1.5 times the delta minimum, we consider that our building as torsion irregularity. Let's check for torsion irregularity. For that, let us go to our topmost plan that is the seventh floor plan let's see the deflected shape of our structure or the deformed shape of our structure under this eqx so this is the deflected shape let's check for these two ends you see that the deflection for this end is in x direction is 102.389 and the deflection at this end is 114. So 102.389 into 1.5, you get to be 153. But here it's only 114. So there is no torsion irregularity now structure for this x direction. Now if you check for y direction, EQYULS, you see that the deflection for this end is 130 and this end is 129 it's almost equal so there is no need to check for that it's okay you can see from this displayed figure also there is no rotation these two ends are traveling simultaneously or parallelly so this is the way to check for torsion irregularity So we have performed some checks after modeling and analysis of our structure and we have looked for the assumptions of semi-rigid and rigid diaphragms also and we have checked for fundamental mode shapes also. So this analysis part is almost complete now. In our next lecture we will go for the design portion and we will see the design of beam column and shear walls. And in this lecture series, uh, we will learn how to design the MAT foundation in safe software also. So that those will be dealt with in our upcoming lectures. I want to end this analysis lecture today. We'll meet again soon. Thank you.